And I think when you're trying to create high performance, you know, for us, we're trying to create high performance in, the, in, in a harsh environment of the Borneo jungle, and you're trying to create high performance in the harsh environment of business, is that we begin to realize, you know, the preparation is endless and the execution is exhausting. So how do we continuously regenerate success? And it's elusive. It's difficult for people. There are people that have had the flash in the pan moments of their career, but you know what we want is to be capable of creating longevity to our uh, success and our ability in industry. And you know, that's, that's a difficult, difficult task. And so to give you a sense of that endless preparation for EcoChallenge, if you're not familiar with EcoChallenge, created by Mark Burnett, most of us know Mike Burnett quite well from you know, the, the Survivor and Apprentice fame, and EcoChallenge was his first Emmy-winning television production. But first and foremost, it's a race. And Mark Burnett created EcoChallenge because he had raced in the very original um, long kind of expedition adventure race called Raid Galois, which was in France. And he had raced in that and came to America and decided this would be a great opportunity to take you know, the human factor of performance in athletics and pit it against the difficulty of, of stress in an environment. And so the way EcoChallenge works is they announce in February what country has been awarded that year's race, that year's world championship. And the host country then makes a, an announcement of what sports are going to be in that year's race. And as this show became more and more popular, when we raced in Borneo, this was watched by a billion people worldwide. So you can imagine that countries became very, very interested in it as an opportunity to showcase their nation to the world. So they would inject these unique sports that would kind of take viewers into a, a certain area of the country or a certain you know, um, aspect of their culture that they wanted to display. But as an athlete, these were sports that we had never had exposure or opportunity to compete in. So we had to, from that announcement in February, we had until the race started in September to become not only proficient in all of these new sports, but certified in them before we got to the start line, for safety reasons, obviously. And so for me at the time, I was a single mom. I was raising twin boys on my own. I was a senior executive in a subsidiary of the H.J. Hines Company in Toronto, where I live. And I was training these high volume of hours. And so just in order to make the whole process work, I had to go to my younger sister and beg her to move into my house with me so that I could train in the hours outside of when my kids would, would have care. And any of the women in the room who have sisters know that I am still repaying that debt <laughs> to this day. But fortunately for me, she agreed. And so what that allowed me to do, a typical schedule for me, was every weekday, my alarm would go off at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I would sneak out of my house so that I wouldn't wake my kids up. And then as soon as I got out the door, I would jump in my car. I'd rush down to Lake Ontario, right near where I live. And I would meet our paddling coach and my teammates, and we would paddle for two hours every morning as the sun was coming up. And then as soon as we were done our paddle practice, I'd rush back home. I'd get my kids out of bed. I'd get them off to school. I'd get myself showered. I'd get to work. At lunch, I would do a weight training session. At the end of the day, back in my car, rush home, pick up the kids, get them home. And any of you with young school-aged children know the routine. It's like homework, dinner, bath, bed, book, right? And then there were, when they were finally asleep, I was back out the door usually training for you know, a few hours at night, because this race, once the starting gun goes, it, it can be a 24-hour-a-day race if you're physically capable of doing it. Like for us, we don't sleep for the first three days of this race. We race nonstop for three days, and then after the third day, we would sleep for about an hour and a half at about 5 a.m., so you kind of trick yourself w into waking up at least what you think would be a traditional time of day to wake up and start your day. And so if you're going to race in the darkness and sleep deprived, you've got to train in the darkness and sleep deprived. And so throughout this entire training process, every Tuesday night, we had a cycling training workout that went from 8 o'clock at night until 2 o'clock in the morning. And every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. was my weekly meeting with my boss throughout this entire process. And you know, after months of that, and the volume of training goes up and up, on weekends we would train 24 hours straight or 36 hours straight. And so as this process went on and we're getting closer to the start of the race, you know, it started to affect me massively. And one particular Tuesday night, we had our cycling training workout scheduled. 
I literally dragged my sorry butt into the workout. And the coach stops, he looks at me, and he's like, Yvonne, what's wrong? I said, I'm exhausted. Like, I'm exhausted. And the thing about this race, if you're not familiar with it, four-person team has to be co-ed. That is a basic rule of eco-challenges. The teams must be co-ed. Men and women working together, similar to what we experience in the workforce. However, in athletics, you know, I'm the first to acknowledge, you know, in this race, first of all, almost every team, even though you could have three females and one male to make it co-ed, all of the teams, competitive teams at the world championship level are three males and one female. And I'm the first to acknowledge men faster and stronger than women in athletics. So what that meant to me is that I was always the slowest person. Always, no matter how hard I tried, I was always the slowest person. So on this particular night, I looked at our, train, our cycling coach and I said, you know, I don't even want to try and keep up to these guys tonight. And what he said to me that night has impacted my life almost every day since. Because he looked at me and he said, you know, Yvonne, eight out of every 10 workouts that you and I are going to do together are going to be perfectly fine, right? You show up, you get on the bike, you do the workout. It's exactly what we both expect. He said, but one out of every 10 workouts that you and I are going to do together is going to be complete crap. You're going to hate it. You're going to hate every second of it. You're going to get on the bike and immediately feel like you've got lead for legs. You know, cement blocks for feet. And he said, all I'm going to tell you is on that day, give yourself credit for showing up. Just give yourself credit for showing up, get through it, and go home. Because one out of every 10 workouts that you and I are going to do together is going to be amazing. It's going to be brilliant. You're going to get on the bike and feel fast. And he said, you know, that's the day that I'll be here to tell you to push it. Because you should explore what you are capable of when you're doing it at your best. You know, and I walked away from that conversation, and I realized just how often, as you know, human beings, we have a tendency to pause and examine ourselves when we're complete crap. It stops us in our tracks. Right? When I think about, I get reviews back from a, a presentation, or you, know, you think about reviews of, of a, a film, you automatically tend to look at the most negative ones and think about what they're telling you. And that's what we tend to do with performance reviews. Studies have shown you, know, you give somebody 10 pieces of feedback, three of them negative, you know, seven of them positive. You go back three months later and ask them what feedback they were given, and they remember the three negatives. We have a tendency to focus on our non-performance. And that's why, you know, I want you at this very moment in time to just pause for a second and remind yourself of the last time you were brilliant. I want you to pull up in your mind a moment in time when you impressed yourself. And you know, what I can tell you is in athletics, we pay incredible attention to that moment. We pay incredible attention to a single performance where we exceeded our own expectations, when things went better than we expected. And what we do is we pay a ton of attention to everything we think contributed to that. So I want you to do that. You just thought about a moment when you've seen yourself at your best. I want you to expand your mind outwards. How did you set yourself up? When you've performed at your absolute best, how did you set yourself up? And then again, in competitive athletics, what we do is we try as hard as possible to gather all that back up around ourselves, to give ourselves not only the opportunity to duplicate our single best performance, but surpass it, go beyond it. And that, that's what I call the challenge of improvement.